All right, Acts chapter 1, that's where we're going to, uh, to be. Um, if you will recall, as we're working here through the book of Acts, we're seeing that it is the, it's the Acts of the apostles. We're seeing what happened when the Lord Jesus Christ having raised up disciples and having um, redeemed mankind through his work on the cross, he then passed the baton, so to speak, onto these uh, disciples. And, and what, what Acts is is just how uh, spirit-filled believers then carried the gospel really to the ends of the earth. And it's the, the there's, there's uh, 28 chapters in this book. And what we've been talking about is that we're writing now Acts 29, as it were, uh, how we're living out our faith. So it's been, you know, neat just to, to uh, start going through this book and to see uh, how the church was birthed and all. And today what we're going to focus on is prayer. And um, just the significant aspect of the dynamic of prayer, how it is a foundational priority in the body of Christ, in the church, that there are implications for us here today. And, you know, as we were worshiping the Lord today, I just had, uh, I had this thought. Um, I remember when Brenda and I first brought home uh, my, my daughter Megan from the hospital, first, first child ever born, um, and, um, and, you know, here you're taking the kid home and you're thinking somebody, somebody's messed up. Like we, we're kids ourselves. I mean, we're 20, you know, Brenda's, you know, we're both 21 and, and I've got, i got this baby. Like who, who, who trusts me with this kid? You know, we put the, we put her in the car. We, we went through the drive through at McDonald's. Uh, and then we got home and we set Megan up in her car seat in the carrier on the table and then we're eating lunch and we look at each other, we're like, now what? You know, and, and, and uh, you know, it's hard to convey the weight that we, we're carrying in that moment. But there was, there was a distinct weight. And, and I thought about that as we were worshiping because I was thinking about the church here and, and where these disciples are. We left off with Jesus having ascended into heaven. And there was a mandate given uh, to the disciples. You see it in verse 9. It says, when, when he had spoken these things, while the disciples watched, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while these disciples looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, that kind of thing doesn't happen every day. You can understand why they're you know, just mesmerized. It says, as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And, and, and so there is this, this exhortation basically, hey, rather than gazing into the heavens, you need to get to work here on earth. And I like the way John Stott put it. He said, we need to hear the implied message of the angels, which is this. You've seen him go. You'll see him come. But between that going and coming, there must be another going and coming. The spirit must come and you must go into the world for Christ. And the vision you are to cultivate is not upwards in nostalgia to, to the heaven which has received Jesus, but outwards in compassion to the lost world that desperately needs him. And so this is the mandate that they've been given. And, you know, think about it. This is a weighty thing. This is a heavy thing. This is a, up until this point, the Lord Jesus has been, sh has been shouldering this burden, has been doing all the leading, and y'all have just been following. And now what's going to happen is that even though there's, it's still a, the Lord leading and you following kind of dynamic, well, quite frankly, it's a lot easier when he's with you in the flesh, Right? And so there is this weight, there is this burden, here they are, and Jesus had told them in verse 4, don't leave Jerusalem, 
<coughs> but wait for the gift that my father has promised. He's talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he's like, you need to wait for that. And so we see in verse 12, it says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey, about half a mile, three quarters of a mile or so. Uh, and when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, and Philip, and Thomas, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but Judas, the son of James. And verse 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Notice they're praying with Mary. They're not praying to Mary, okay? Uh, important distinction here. Uh, but they are all praying. And here is the wait. Here is the picture. Here is the, the get that we need to read this with, with this understanding. Jesus has ascended into heaven. You have received the baton and the duty and the calling, and you're going to receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit but you have to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, with that kind of a weight that you've got, there's a weight of responsibility. Yeah, there's a physical waiting aspect of it, but there is a weight of responsibility here, a heavy, this is, this is a heavy thing. And so they are, they're praying, man. They're praying like never before. I remember... Uh, I went on a missions trip to Banda Aceh. It was after the, the big uh, tsunami, um, you know, many years ago where, you know, over 100,000 people in, just in Banda Aceh alone had lost their lives. Uh, it was closed prior to this to Westerners. It was a Muslim stronghold. You could not go in there and live to tell this, the, the tale as a, as, a, as a, you know, somebody who's not uh, a, a Muslim. And so... We went in and we're going to do evangelistic work there. And, and so we flew into Banda Aceh and we had, we got on a UN helicopter and as if Banda Aceh wasn't remote enough, we had to go from one side of the island to the other side of the island. And we get on board this UN helicopter, we fly over, and it was full on like every Vietnam movie you've ever seen. It was, it was that. We, it's a, it's a double-bladed aircraft. We fly in, we land, and it's a hot unload, right? And so that means the rotors are still going. You jump out of this thing literally into the, the grass that's blowing, and your head's ducked down so, you know, doesn't lop your head off or the blades, and you, you run away, you know, from, from the aircraft, and then it takes off. And so this is incredible noise. This is incredible scene. And then next thing you know, it's just silent and it's just us. You want to talk about, you're, you're doing some heavy praying right now. Because at this point, it's about four o'clock in the afternoon, sun's going down, and where are we? I don't know. We're just on the other side of this devastation in this, in this Muslim territory, and we don't, know, we don't know anybody there. And all we've got is our backpacks, and that's it. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? I don't know. We're praying like never before. This is what's going on here. This is the dynamic. They're praying. Hey, God's promised he's going he's gonna to do this work. He's going he's gonna to show up. He, and so they're waiting for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, that, that the Lord God had given. John chapter 14, here's the promise. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I'll pray the Father. He will give to you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he'll be in you. And so this is the promise that they had. It's the promise that they're waiting for. But curiously, there in verse 14, we see them praying to receive this promise. And, and that begs a question. It's like, why? Why would you pray for something that Jesus has already promised to give to you twice? Well, here's why. To begin with, prayer is an institution of God, and we are commanded throughout Scripture 
to pray. Right? Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 7. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who, who ask him? And so prayer is an institution of God. We are commanded throughout Scripture to pray as well. God's promises, rather than rendering prayer unnecessary, understand God's promises actually potentiate our prayers in two key ways. In other words, when God gives you a promise, it's not like, oh, I don't need to pray about that because he's promised that to me. No, it potentiates prayer. Number one, here's, here's one of the ways that it potentiates prayer. God's promises give us confidence that he's going to hear and answer our prayers, right? Uh, the Apostle John said this, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example. When, when I preach the gospel up here, um, and it, you know, and I'll give, uh, I'll, I'll give an invitation in preaching the gospel. Hey, you know, if, if today you would like to receive Christ as your Lord and savior, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to this right where you're at. You can, you can pray, you can ask Jesus, Jesus, I, I believe that, that you're the savior. I know I'm a sinner. I'm asking you to come into my life now, please Lord, save me and, and do that. And, and as, a, as a pastor, when I give that invitation, um, there could potentially be some reservation on my part. Like, you know, what if, what if I give an invitation and nobody responds? What if, I, what if I throw a party and nobody comes kind of deal, right? And, and so there could be that, that hesitation. Now, here's why there's not. First of all, uh, my job is just to deliver the mail. You know, what, you know, what God does with the mail, what you do with God's mail and, and how you interact with it, that's on you, right? So my, my job isn't that, you know, to make people respond. It's just to deliver the mail and let you do business with the Spirit of God. But as well, I'm dealing with promises here. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus had given the great, com the, the great commission, go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations. First John 1 John 1.9, he says... If we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? That confess just to agree with God. God, I, I believe that you're God. I believe that I'm a sinner and, and I'm going to prevail upon your promises. Romans 10, 9 says that if you openly declare Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you're going to be saved. Now, <laughs> these, are, these are the truths of scripture. And this, so my mandate, it becomes very easy. When I give an altar call, when I pray, I do so with extreme confidence, knowing I'm in the will of God. This is just what God is going to do, right? We, I like what Henry Allen Ironside said this. He said, when God is going to do some great thing, he moves the hearts of people to pray stirring them up to pray in such a way that they might be prepared for it. Let me ask you a question. Are you prepared for what God might want to do in your life today? Are you prepared for what God might want to do in your life today? You can be. It's a matter of just coming to the Lord in prayer. We get all up in our heads. It would be so easy for these disciples in Acts chapter one to get all up in their heads and go, I'm not Jesus. Like how on earth can, what do you mean I'm gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon me and I'm, I'm gonna you know, go and be your witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth? Like that is too, that's a bridge way too far. I can't possibly do that. Guess what? You can't. But in Christ you can. And this is a bold confidence just to go, you know what, God? All your promises are yes and amen. And so, so, uh, so it's a matter of just saying, 
I'm going to pray. <coughs> Jeremiah the prophet said this, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in his own abilities. Is that what he said? No, whose confidence is in him, in the Lord. Paul said to the Ephesians, in God, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in ourselves. Yes, no, in him. This is what Paul said. And this truth about prayer has massive implications for our lives. And so, uh, so there's, there's two ways that God's promises potentiate our prayers. That was the first way. The second way is that God's promises lend authority to our prayers. They lend authority to our prayers. When I, when I set out to plant this church, let me just tell you this. I, I took a massive step into the unknown. Like, like today, you know, we, we all thank you, Jesus. Like it's, it's evident what God is doing and, and wants to continue to do. But when I started this church, the, I had no money, no bank account, no church underwriting this endeavor, this venture of faith, no facility, no staff, and none of that stuff. There's a reason we named this church Reliance Church, because if God didn't show up, we were sunk. It's like, God, we're, we're relying upon you. I'm holding on to you. You, like a life raft, you know? All I had, <coughs> besides my man cold here today that I brought back from Europe, all I had was a calling and a promise from God. That's all I had. God had said, go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And here's this promise. He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And this promise brought God-sized authority to what I was going to then, therefore, not only do, but what I was going to pray for. Hey, I just, I just had incredible boldness just to go, you know what, God, you're the one who promised that you were, that you wanted to do this work. You're the one who commanded me to, to go out and proclaim the gospel. And so, you know, what it looks like is totally up to you, but I'm just taking you at your word. Charles Spurgeon said this, he said, faith will boldly plead all God's gracious relationships. It will authoritatively say to God, are you not the creator? Will you forsake the work of your own hands? Are you not the redeemer? You have redeemed your servant. You will, will you cast me away? It's like, no, wait a minute, God, you said it. What are you, you going to not, are you going to not back up what you, what you said? It, it gives me this opportunity. I can pray with great authority based on, on God's promises. And that's just the idea. God, you promised it. You, you, you're the, your word declares that this is the way it's going to go. God, I, I'm just declaring that in my prayers. Uh, 2 Corinthians 120, we sang it today. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. All his promises are yes and amen. And so it's with that authority, it's with that confidence that these disciples here in verse 14 are, are gathering and praying and seeking uh, the Lord. Listen, the church is supposed to be that place where we live out the values of our faith in authentic community. And, and this is, this, the idea is this is where our culture reflects what we say we value. That's what the church is supposed to be. And one of the things that as Christians we say we value is prayer. And so church is supposed to be that place where our culture reflects that. But let me tell you, that doesn't just magically happen. It takes diligent focus. Just as these disciples are diligently focused to pray, this takes diligent focus. I like what James Smith said in his book, You Are What You Love. He says, the body of Christ is that unique community of practice whose members own up to the fact that we don't always value what we say we value. Why? Because we're sinners with a sin nature and that, that we are, we're drawn away and prone to, to drifting. That's why. That's why we don't always value practically what we say that we value. 
And Smith goes on to say, in essence, that what makes healthy churches unique is that we work hard to institute practices that shape our spiritual formation. And that's why you'll find when you come here, we are working hard to, to get you to pray, to be a praying church. We recently offered, hey, 24-7 prayer. Uh, for what? So that we could be a praying church and seeking the Lord and what it is that God wants to do in us and through us. The, the, the church is that place where <coughs> we, we ha have many promises from the Lord. But we need to press into those promises in prayer, right? And, and seek the Lord. Now, what is, what is prayer? What is this idea of prayer? Basically, prayer is communicating with God. It's communicating with God. And if I asked you to define communication right now, this is something that I do in counseling uh, when, you know, you got a, a couple together and you want to talk about communication in marriage. Uh, and a lot of times in pre-marriage counseling, I'll ask somebody, hey, why don't you define communication? And, and inevitably, nine times out of ten, when a person defines communication, it's all about speaking. And, and uh, very rarely does the person include the listening part of communication. And communication is both. It's listening and it's speaking, right? And you remember back in the days when we had a pager? Hey, that was a treat, right? It went off. It just was one way, you know? And prayer is two-way. It's where we can talk to God and we can listen to how the Lord might, might speak to us. And it's the greatest privilege that we have as Christians that we can have this two-way communication with the Lord. Not only is it a privilege, it's a huge responsibility. Jesus said in Luke chapter 18 that men should always pray and not lose heart. Why? Because when we pray, we admit our need for God and our total dependence upon him. In other words, it's not intended, prayer is not intended to be a means of trying to get from God what it is that we want right? That, that rather it's supposed to be a means by which we enable God to give us what he wants. And you're like, wait a minute, we're talking about a holy sovereign God. How do you enable a holy sovereign God? Here's how you enable him. You surrender. You take the will that God has given to you and you surrender it unto him, right? And so <coughs> prayer is this thing you know, we, we approach prayer so often, um, I have used, I've heard this analogy and I've used it several times, that for us, it, sometimes God becomes the pinata and, and prayer is the stick and we just feel like, I'm just gonna beat, beat the pinata until all the goodies come falling out, right? And, and it's, it's not that at all. Uh, I like what Billy Graham said, he said, prayer is the rope that pulls God and man together, but it doesn't pull God down to us, it, rather it pulls us up to him. And listen, that's important because our lives, I don't know the last time you checked, they're filled with anxieties. Filled with anxieties, filled with fears. And these anxieties, they tempt us to carry burdens that God doesn't want us carrying. He wants us to surrender these to him. Paul said this, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. He said, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Right? Be anxious for nothing. That, that word anxious in the Greek, literally it means to have a distracting care. Do you know what it is to have a distracting care? Like when you're stressed out about money, like you are stressed and, and two o'clock in the morning, you're wide awake. That's a treat, isn't it? And you're just there and all you've got, what, what is it? It is a distracting care. A, uh, you've got a troubled relationship. It's a distracting care. You're consumed with, you know, you can't eat, you can't sleep, you're worried about this, or you've got a medical issue and it's overwhelming and it is, it is an absolute distracting care. It's been said that anxiety is anticipating the future in the worst possible scenario and freaking out about it. Who's good at that? 
my hands up, right? I'm, I, I, I lettered in this in high school, right? I mean, I'm just like, this is, this, here's the deal. Anxiety is a massive problem in the United States, right? There's a, a study published by the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, and it was entitled The Economic Burden of Anxiety Disorders. Uh, here's what they found. They found that anxiety disorders are the most common medical health illness, mental health illness in the United States, that, it, that it, it impacts well over 40 million Americans. 20% uh, of the U.S. population over the age uh, of 18, that's one in five, uh, suffer uh, with anxiety. Now, by the way, uh, after COVID, Boston College did their own study, and they found that between the ages of 18 and 29, that the rates of anxiety and depression are actually 65%. And so if you take this study and if you extrapolate it to the US population, basically their study says 65% of all Americans are overwhelmed with anxiety and depression post-COVID, right? It's a massive issue. Um, if if you have anxiety, studies show that you're five times more likely to go to the doctor, that you're six times more likely to be hospitalized, that the related costs are, uh, well, these are very old numbers, $42 billion a year. It's probably easily double that now. Um, and those don't even, th those don't factor in the loss of productivity, right? And, and so, so it's massive financial implications, right? This same study said, okay, what causes anxiety? It's like, well, what doesn't cause anxiety, right? I mean, I just reading these statistics, I'm like, I, I'm anxious from that. <laughs> it's like, you ever read like, you know, there's diseases that you read, it's like, you know, you might have this disease and you start reading the symptoms and you're like, oh my God, I gotta go to the doctor. I think I've got this. You know, it's a, it's, it's, foreign, it's a foreign bug. You can only get it in Africa. I don't know, I've got it. I think, I think I've got it, right? <clears throat> what causes anxiety? Six leading causes. Number one, fractured support systems. Uh, this could include lack of family or friends or a breakdown in those relationships or isolation from them. Um, some of you are all like, my family is my problem, right? And so there you go. You just, that's one of the leading causes. Financial trouble, uh, duh, right? Um, lifestyle that contradicts natural rhythms. Here's the idea. The sun goes down and you don't. That's a massive cause of anxiety. Uh, the constant noise and interruption of technology causes anxiety. Uh, my personal theory as to why so many young Americans are dealing with anxiety uh, today, social media and uh, our phones. Um, overwork, the average American works well in excess of 50 hours a week. And here's the sixth one, events that induce fear and or a loss of hope. Again, can you relate, right? Anxiety, it's, it, it's there. So what Paul says in Philippians verse four is don't be anxious. And you're like, well, thanks, Paul. Uh, that's great. How? He says, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that we let our requests be made known to God. Prayer is talking to God. Supplication, it's expressing our needs to God, right? And thanksgiving, it's remembering God's faithfulness. It's remembering how God has been there for us. And in doing those three things, here's what Paul says. Paul says, we let our requests be made known to God. The idea is that it's active and it's ongoing when we pray. That there's, there's, there's to be an active and ongoing flow of talking to God, of expressing our needs to God, and of in the process remembering his faithfulness as we do uh, these things. I want to close with this. Jesus told a parable. He said, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. And you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit. I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. Doors locked for the night. And my family and I were all in bed. I can't help you. But Jesus said, I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep locking, knocking long enough, He'll get up and he'll give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. 
Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Now you're like, wait a minute. Is, it, you mean if I just bug God enough, he's going to give it to me? <coughs> this is what's known as a juxtaposition, this story that Jesus employs. It's where you take two things side by side and, and you compare them. And what Jesus is comparing here is if a sinful man is moved by persistence, how much more is your heavenly, perfect, sinless, loving Father going to be moved by our persistent prayers, right? And it's not that God wants us to beg. It's that he wants us to come to him and he wants us to experience his faithfulness, these disciples here in Acts, they're waiting for the, the promise of the Father. And he's going he's gonna to rock the world. He's going to change the world through these spirit-filled believers, right? But he wants them to come to him and to experience his faithfulness, to see his goodness in a tangible way, and to grow in their faith as they persistently prevail upon the Lord. Listen, are you persistent in prayer? Ian Bound said this in his book, Power Through Prayer. He said, the church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. Men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men. And then he goes on to say this, the person who prays puts God into the work. God does not come into our work as a matter of course or principle, but he comes in by prayer and by urgency. Three questions as we close. Question number one, what am I worried about that I should be praying about? We just, I could just leave you with that one right there. What are you worried about that you should be praying about? Question number two, what has God promised to me that I should be praying for? What, what, what are his promises in my life? Okay, so I should be praying for those things is the idea. And thirdly, what are the things that I'm working on but I'm neglecting to pray for? 